And good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Executive Next Practice Institute and our next VX series featuring Sally Helgeson. Uh, my name is Scott Hamilton. I just want to do a quick introduction here. We've got a couple of slides to start you off and give you some context, and then we'll get into this very exciting interview we've been looking forward to for quite some time now. Um, just a little bit of background here. Uh, again, we're based at the University of California, Irvine, Beale Applied Innovation. Uh, this is a picture of our center. It's in, again, in Irvine, California. We're based in Southern California, but this is a global organization. So this morning, uh, in this very interactive discussion uh, with Sally, please use the Q&A function that you find on your screen. Uh, there's a Q&A there, as well as a private chat feature. Feel free to use those beginning now for any of the questions that you have for Sally or Louise or myself as we go through today's session. A um, little bit of background about the Executive Next Practice Institute. Uh, we're now, this is probably almost over 400 sessions actually by now. 60,000 people have gone through our sessions, both in person and online. Uh, we look at first looks at emerging trends uh, we bring in top C-suite leaders led by th other thought leaders to look at um, what's coming, um, what will transform our organizations and take us forward. This is what we used to look like just a few short months ago, uh, in-person events, wall to wall. Uh, we will soon get back to that. We're looking forward to that. But in the meantime, these virtual events have been extremely popular. We're several hundred people uh, per session and we invite you to join them on a regular basis. The value proposition for you to join our organization and participate is that this is your connection with C-suite leaders from multiple industry sectors. Um, the information you're gonna see has likely not been seen by others. It's a first look at new information and first conversations. Uh, we obviously have quality contributors like Sally and others come on on a regular basis. And your participants that are on this call today are global. We have over 55 countries on the call, on the viewing this this morning, as well as they are from small, mid-size, and large cap organizations. So um, those are some of your peers that are on the viewing today. Just a quick update. This Thursday, remind, two days from today, at 11 a.m. East Coast time, 8 a.m. Pacific, is our Global Pass to Rebound. Please join this summit. Uh, join all or part of it. It begins at 11 a.m. East Coast time. Again, these are complimentary thanks to our tremendous sponsors and partners we have out there. Again, that's this Thursday. Please join us for that. And then uh, in July is our reInvent series, which is featuring some top speakers about HR leading the rebound as we come through COVID-19 and beyond. Quite exciting lineup of uh, Folks, including Dr. Dina Brown, Paul Falcone of the Screen Actors Guild, uh, Ewing Gillespie out of IBM. So please, again, join us July 16th for that session. All right, thanks to our primary sponsor today, that's Nextwork Strategy, which is the award-winning advisory team that puts on virtual strategic summits. Again, you'll get some more information about this following the session, and we appreciate their support today for this uh, endeavor. Now. Uh, our terrific partner in crime today is Louise Keefe, uh, who is one of our ENP advisors. Uh, Louise is the owner and principal of uh, Perspectives. It's a consulting practice that provides some very unique and creative solutions to their clients. Uh, she does a lot of executive coaching, talent development, talent strategy, inclusion, diversity, change management, team building. Uh, she has a wealth of knowledge with over 20 years of experience with Fortune 500 companies, plus working with hundreds of HR and business leaders. She's fascinated by the field of neuroscience, neural leadership, and how our brain works, and she is a terrific expert in that arena. Uh, so again, we are delighted to have Luis with us today to lead this conversation with Sally. Sally, uh, again, welcome. Uh, Sally is cited at Forbes as the world's premier expert on women's leadership. Uh, she's an internationally best-selling author, speaker, and leadership coach. She's been ranked number six among the world's top leadership uh, thinkers by Global Gurus, and uh, she's been honored for her transformational influence um, and chosen by the Thinkers 50 by our friend Marshall Goldsmith um, 
in terms of being the world's top coach for women leaders. Her most recent book, How Women's Rise, How Women Rise, was co-authored with Marshall and examines the behaviors that most likely get in the way of successful women. It became a top seller within a one week of publication and it's sold in 19 languages. So again, welcome to our global audience. You'll want to be sure to get a copy of this book. Her previous books include The Female Advantage, The White Women's Ways of Leadership. That's also a classic, been in print since 1990. The Female Vision, Women's Real Power at Work, which covers uh, women's strategic insights, how they can strengthen their career. The Web of Inclusion um, was incited by the Wall Street Journal as one of the uh, best books on leadership of all time and is credited with bringing the language of inclusion into business. So again, very timely discussion today, Sally, uh, and uh, we look forward to, uh, to this conversation. Uh, one other thing, in addition to delivering leadership workshops, seminars, and keynotes for companies around the world, Sally's conduct, consulted with the United Nations on building more inclusive country offices in Af Africa, Asia, led programs at the Harvard Graduate School of Business and Education in Smith College, and has been visiting scholar at Northwestern uh, University. By the way, uh, this is, Sally's got just a tremendous background, as does Louise. Uh, after this viewing session, this is being recorded. It will be on our ENT, ENP TV channel. You'll get the link for that, and you'll get the information on how to connect with both Sally and Louise. So thank you. Uh, I'm going to be joining you in just a couple of minutes, but let's get on with this interview. I'm excited to hear uh, what's happening. So I'm going to stop sharing and turn this over to you, Louise. Great. Thank you, Scott. And thank you for the great uh, introductions. Appreciate it. And Sally, I'm so excited to have you here today. Um, I met Sally earlier this year before all this pandemic and was just delighted to speak with her and just she was just such a wealth of knowledge so we got to share even dinner together which was extra special so I'm really glad Sally that you're able to join us today and just allow us to pick your brain on so many topics so welcome thank you Louise it's wonderful to be here well speaking of the pandemic um, I think everyone is trying to sort through where do we go from here and so I'm curious as you've talked to leaders around the world, what is your perspective of how we get back to that new way of working? Well, I think it's early to put too much definition around what the new normal or the next normal will be. But a few things are very obvious, and uh, probably the primary one is the extent to which working at at and from home will become normalized. I think things are, are changing very rapidly on that front. I spoke with a client recently, very conservative energy company based in the Southern US. And she was saying, you know, our, com our company has never embraced work from home. And she said that has cost us in terms of hiring women. She said, and now our leadership sees they're astonished by the, the lack of impact on productivity. She said, and, and they've said, we will be thinking about this very differently. Uh, some of you may have seen the interview with the chair of Tata conglomerate, the entire conglomerate in the Financial Times, in which he said that they anticipate um, that by the that within the century, 70% of their people will be working from home. That's globally. So I think that's a very, very strong uh, trend. And one of the reasons I find it so fascinating is it will be the first time since the start of the Industrial Revolution where work is being done on what has been traditionally female turf. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a huge shift. Well, actually, that leads me to my next question. Um, um, have you seen this pandemic and working virtually impact women differently than men? In, in some cases, certainly, and especially for women who, uh, for families that have young children at home. Uh, we have seen a lot about, uh, of, of reports that women are, are sharing a heavier burden in terms of childcare, and especially in this phase of the pandemic where children were being homeschooled, it was uh, quite a, uh, <laughs> quite an order to step up to. But I, I believe that over time that will change. Strategy and business had a very interesting uh, piece within the last month 
uh, in which they did a survey, and it said that 70% of the men that they interviewed from, I think it was 16 countries, including the U.S., had reported that they look forward to this time in order to spend more time with their children and to take on more responsibility, at least in that realm. So I think that the fact that people will be working from home, um, maybe not consistently, but for periods of time on a routine basis will begin to change how some of that work, uh, work has been allocated in the home. Sure. Great. Great points. Um, and I think you kind of alluded to this as well. Uh, men and women have found there's, is, despite the fact that this pandemic has just been, had such horrific impact on, you know, pe- people and businesses, our economy, um, there's been some positives come out of it. So I'm curious, you know, what have you seen as some of the positives that have come out of this pandemic? Well, in, uh, in addition to this, this greater um, flexibility in terms of where people will be working, one of the positives that I've seen, and again, this is not to undercut the enormous pain that so many people have gone through, especially in, in the small business community. But, um, you know, I think one of the things that we're really, we will come out of this with slightly adjusted Uh, understandings of what constitutes excellence in leadership. Mm -hmm. This has been going on for about 30 years, the uh, broadening of the definition about what constitutes excellence in leadership. But I think that having watched uh, of the 10 countries that have done the best in terms of addressing the pandemic, the fact that seven of them are led by women, which is way out of proportion to the number of women who lead countries worldwide, has an impact. And it's not just a greater emphasis on human caring and collaborative skills, which, you know, I think that there's certainly an aspect of that. But, but in surveys, there's always been, women have tended to be judged as better leaders by many different measures, but men were always seen as better leaders in a time of crisis. And I think that has has favored men in certain ways. And I think seeing such a large proportion of global female leaders step up and lead superbly in a time of crisis is going to have a long-term impact upon that kind of perception. Absolutely. Great points. Now, I've heard you use a ter- term, cultural humility. So I'm curious, can you share with our listeners today, what does that mean and why is it so relevant today? Well, I think it's really relevant today, but cultural humility essentially means the, the willingness to look at how other cultures handle everything from day, the organization of uh, everyday life to values, to work ethic, to, um, to you know, what is really considered important and what kinds of behaviors are encouraged. To be able to look at that from a place of some humility and say, what, you know, what can we learn? What can our culture learn from what other cult- how other cultures do things? Rather than going into an automatic defensive crouch, uh, which we've seen to some extent in our country, but in the West generally, where, well, you know, we're the best, but, you know, maybe there's something to learn here. We don't need to um, be so insecure that we have to feel like we have to establish that. So I think cultural humility is really a willingness to learn what works in different cultures and have the flexibility to try that on or to consider how it might broaden our own approach to everything from from what constitutes excellence in leadership, which we've been speaking about, to to how we expect people to show up every day. Mm. It's been interesting, I think, over the last few months, people have been I think almost more open-minded, right? Uh, curious, trying new things just because the whole world was rocked. <laughs> so exactly. I, think that, I think it's kind of uh, propelled us maybe to think differently. So I love that. Yes. And I love that term too. So, you know, I am a huge fan of your latest book, How Women I Rise. Um, I read it. I told Sally that sometimes I hear speaking in my head when I'm doing some of the habits. Um, I've recommended it to many of the people um, that I've been coaching and all of them are finding it very, very helpful. 
So I'm curious, what was the impetus and what really inspired you and Marshall Goldsmith to uh, author this book that's, uh, I think, having a huge impact on many of us? Yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate your enthusiasm. You know, Marshall had written a huge international bestseller, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, which was about the habits and behaviors most likely to get in the way of successful people. And he had the brilliant insight that the same habits and behaviors that serve you well early in your career can be the exact same habits and behaviors that undermine you as you seek to move to a more senior level. And I thought that insight was brilliant. We remain, we remain the captive of those behaviors because we recognize that they played a role in mm -hmm. leading us to where we are. However, in that book, which was probably not surprising, surprising given that Marshall's coaching base has historically been heavily male, it seemed to me that there were habits and behaviors that were highly problematic for women that I work with, and I've been working with women leaders around the world for 30 years now, that got left out of the book. And that there were other habits in the book that did not seem to be much of a problem at all for women. You know, Marshall says, learn to apologize is one of the, <laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> but we know that women often have a problem over apologizing or you know, don't always talk about how great you are. Other things that, you know, I, I rarely see with, um, with women. And uh, so I suggested to him, we've been friends and colleagues for uh, over 25 years, I said, you know, we should really collaborate on a book that looks at those behaviors that may have gotten left out that are most likely to get in the way of successful women. And he just loved the idea. So How Women Rise is the result. And uh, it's been, uh, the rest is history. <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. Um, so in your book, you talk about 12 specific habits. Um, what do you see is really resonating most with the women that you're talking to now that you've written the book? What I've found there is the most interest in probably is for, uh, or the most resonance, you know, people say, boy, do I identify with that. Uh, expecting others to spontaneously notice and value your contributions rather than having a plan for making sure that those get noticed particularly important and difficult in today's environment where we're working virtually. Uh, the perfection trap, that's universal. Uh, and I hear it all around the world, you know. And it's not surprising because organizations tend to, research demonstrates organizations tend to reward and promote women based on being precise and correct. So they get the message early that being precise and correct is the way to go. But that's not necessarily perceived of as a fundamental leadership habit uh, and, and, and can really cost women. Putting your job before your career, investing everything in doing a great job in the job you have now and feeling that as long as you do that, that will lead you to whatever is next. So those three, and then lately I've noticed that there's a lot of interest in habit, uh, habit uh, 11, which is ruminating. That is going over, and it's aligned very much with uh, perfectionism. Going over and over and over mistakes you may have had and sort of chewing them over and kind of to some extent, you know, castigating yourself for the for what you did rather than just letting it go moving on and saying okay learn from that what's next yeah unfortunately that's one of mine <laughs> so I, in the book you talk um, in relation to that you talk about the power of oh well so <laughs> you have to share with everyone what what the power of oh well is because i find it to be powerful oh well uh, came to me as a result of working with my uh, co-author, Marshall, who anybody on this call who knows him knows is not a ruminator and does not give himself a hard time. <laughs> Marshall and I had been working on the book in his apartment in New York City. I live about 100 miles north of that. And we never took phone calls, but he got a special signal as we were working from his assistant, picked mm -hmm. up the phone, said, oh, oh, I was supposed to talk to him at... Uh, Dr. Kim, I was supposed to talk to him at two o'clock. Uh, uh, okay, uh, I'll call him back. And then he hung up and he looked at me and went, oh, well. And we continued working. 
Well, I'm on the train going home and I'm thinking, oh, well, now I know who Dr. Kim is. It's <laughs> the CEO at that time of the World Bank. So I'm thinking, if I missed a call with the CEO of the World Bank, I would not be going, oh, well. I would be giving myself a terrible time. What must he think of me? I'm clearly not ready for prime time, blah, blah. So it really had a big impact on me. I came home the next morning. I had a little incident where I forgot something in an article that was being published. It was only online. The, the print version wasn't out yet. And I started to go down the rabbit hole of really giving myself a hard time. What is the guy I interviewed going to think of me getting that detail wrong? And suddenly, through a mist, Marshall's response of, oh, well, came to me. And so I printed out on my printer, I put it on the largest font it would accommodate and made a banner. And if I could turn my computer around here in my office, I could show you a banner that I have that says, oh, well, to try to remind myself that when I mess something up, I'm a human being, I'm not a perfect person. And even if it's a problem, oh, well oh, well, that's what happened. And it's proved to be one of the most resonant um, concepts in the book. If I can take just one minute, I was doing a program at a, you know one of the world's most famous and influential technology companies out in the Valley about two weeks before the pandemic started. And a woman stood up and she said, you know, your oh well was the most helpful thing. She said, but I have to tell you, she said, I have stickies all over my house that say oh well. And to remind myself to constantly say oh well, she said, and uh, she said, two days ago, my three year old came into the kitchen carrying a bowl of jello, tripped, it broke, spilled on the floor, and she looked at me and she went, oh, well. <laughs> she said, so now I know I'm raising the next generation of confident women. <laughs> love it. Love right. it. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah, I found it to be very powerful myself. So thank Good. you. Good. I'm glad, Louise. <laughs> now, when I think about, you know, all the, um, you know, women, that, women and men that are reading this, right, how do you uh, start breaking some of these habits. So, I mean, the oh well certainly happens, ha helps with a number of these, but any other suggestions where people are saying, you know what, I do resonate with a number of these. How do I move past them? We have a template in the book for breaking habits that hold you back. And uh, the first, I'm going to share very briefly the first uh, two aspects of that. The first is choose one thing. People say, oh, I have nine behaviors. I have six. I have four. I have 12. Uh, choose one. Start with one behavior or habit or one part of a behavior and, or habit and work on that until you feel satisfied before you move on. The second step is the most important, and that is enlist other people in helping you. Uh, Marshall has fantastic research, almost a million uh, people worldwide, showing that the one characteristic of people that people share who are able to make positive behavioral improvements over time is that they don't try to do it alone. They work with a coach, they work with a peer coach, or they do what I call informal enlistment. You're walking into a meeting. You have identified from this book that you need to be more concise in your presentations. That's a, a common thing with women, too much background, too many words, too many details. Um, you've identified that you could benefit by being more concise. So you ask a couple people as you're going, going in, you know, I'm working on being more concise. Could you watch me in this meeting? Or you could do it now. Could you watch me in our Zoom meeting and let me know? if I see how I seem to be doing on concise and give me any suggestions. I'm really open to them or go to someone who you know is very good at being concise. Hey, I'm working hard on being more concise. Um, you're really, really good at that. I've noted that. Could you share any tips you do in preparation? So what you're doing is you're gathering information. You're informally engaging people as allies in your own behavioral and thus career development, and you're also advertising the fact that you're changing. They're more likely to notice when they have been put on notice uh, that this is something you're working on. So it's a very, very effective habit 
that applies to all of the external mm -hmm. behaviors. Perfectionism and rumination are more internal, but you can certainly engage people in terms of, I'm trying to get over my perfectionism. Do you have any thoughts? What would be an effective, you know, you can ask your, you can say to someone you're working with, I'm working hard to get over my perfectionism. What do you think on this job needs to be done 100%? What needs to be done 90? What needs to be done 80? Engage people in that way. It's very effective. Yeah, I think people appreciate even when you do ask for their guidance or advice. So love it. Love it. Thank you. <laughs> Great advice. Sure. Um, so I think, you know, a lot of us women have, are attracted to this book, but I'm curious, what, uh, what advice do you have for men? Like, why should they read this book? Well, two things I would want to say. First of all, the thing that surprised me is from the day this book came out, men have been telling me, and especially men um, from, uh, you know, who are African-American or Latino or in, not in the mainstream of, you know, the white male heterosexual leaders have told me, I identify with so many of these behaviors. I believe that's because their experience is in some ways the same. They've been um, accustomed to having, for example, their expertise questioned on something in the way that women have. But I've also had men very unexpected, um, you know, who are real, you know, more traditional mainstream leaders say, oh boy, I really have an issue with overvaluing expertise or perfection or, um, you know, some of the other habits and the behaviors in the book. So I think it can be very helpful to men in that way. But the way that I think in general, I am seeing it be used by men is to help them understand, better understand uh, the women in their organizations and recognize what can get in their way, what the internal barriers are. There are external barriers, certainly. Cultural and structural, those continue in different ways in different organizations. But this book is addressed to the internal barriers and it's very helpful. I've heard from from hundreds and hundreds of male leaders that this is helpful in that to them in mentoring, sponsoring, um, being allies, champions and supporters of women who they believe are talented and have the potential to be making very substantial contributions to their organization. Mm. Great, great, great advice. And um, I, think, I think many people will pick up the book. Um, speaking of inclusion, Sally, uh, what um, suggestions do you have for leaders right now that are trying to be more inclusive, right? They may not be able to connect, they may not be able to relate. What tips, advice, guidance? do you have for people that really are trying to make an effort to be more inclusive? I think two things are really important. First of all, recognize that inclusion is demonstrated always in behaviors. It is not, it's wonderful to put out a statement on inclusion and how it matters to the organization and have the CEO do that. But people judge the inclusiveness of an organization based on the leader's behaviors. That's how it's done. Uh, and so that, that being able to, um, to demonstrate inclusive behaviors, in particular, the, the ability to see a non-traditional employee, a woman, African-American, Latino, uh, if you're in another, uh, in, in, you know, in different cultures, different underrepresented groups, to be able to see that person's potential, not just their contributions, is really key to demonstrating an inclusive approach. And the other thing is I find, because I've been doing since the Web of Inclusion came out in 1995, I've been doing a lot of inclusive culture and diversity and inclusion work all around the world. And what I've found is that whereas inclusive behaviors are in, 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 in excellent global organizations tend to be well represented at the senior leadership level. They often do not get translated down about two or three levels to supervisory, wherever it is people actually live in the organization. And if you've got an organization where the senior leaders walk the walk and talk the talk, but 
those at the third level tend to dismiss it or say, oh, yeah, they're the leader. They have to be politically correct, whatever it is. Then you are not, the employee is not going to uh, have an experience of the organization or the culture as inclusive. So that is where, in my experience, much more work needs to be done. Um, you know, the site supervisor at uh, in a mining company, if that site supervisor is not inclusive at all in his or her behaviors, it really doesn't matter what the CEO is saying in terms of the perception of the employee. Hmm. Have you seen anything be effective like when an organization, and again, I think people are well-intentioned many times, but miss the mark. What have you seen work, uh, work within organizations that, again, are trying to create an environment that is welcoming, where people can show up as their whole self? Have you seen anything in particular that's worked well? Well, I think the most important thing is that you've got to start with a very strong rationale for why we're doing this that people believe that people can buy into. And that that has to be done, you have to look internally at the culture. I worked with a large um, natural resources company that was based outside the US. I won't give the details. Uh, it was an excellent company and had terrific uh, senior leaders. Uh, but it had come from a very, very traditional sort of German mining culture mentality. Nothing against Germans, I'm not saying here, but it was just a certain, you know, an engineering culture that had valued numbers over people. And when they did their first, um, when they did their first uh, employee survey, they included a few questions about inclusion on the survey. And what they found when they began to correlate all the information that they were shocked at how non-inclusive the organization was perceived to be in many areas. What they found was an, a precise correlation between the safety of the sites, that energy production company, and the perception of inclusion. Hmm. So that gave them a profoundly um, strong rationale for trying to build a more inclusive culture because the, the catastrophic impacts of safety events was so profound. Mm -hmm. So that gave them what they needed to really drive home the message that you know, an inclusive culture is what we need to survive to financially survive, um, to have a license to operate in a lot of, of countries. And uh, this is absolutely necessary. And it also gave them the nerve to hold people who were high level contributors to account for acting inclusively and to show them the door when they did not. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, that kind of relates to uh, kind of the next topic around innovation and diversity of thinking. Um, what are your thoughts on how women can really drive innovation and diversity of thinking and kind of maybe even sometimes put themselves out there to encourage that? Well, I think that the one of the most essential things for women in terms of women often have, you know, I put it, um, it, it back in 2010 when I wrote The Female Vision, uh, talking about women's broad spectrum notice, their ability to notice a lot of things that, was ha that were happening at the same time. I put it in terms of the language of seeing around the corners uh, that mm -hmm. women often have that capacity. But women self-censor. They self-censor often because they are trying to manage perceptions. I don't want this person to think that I'm arrogant. I don't want this person to think I'm too ambitious. I don't want to suck up all the air in the room. What would people think? So women are often will trip themselves up by trying to overmanage the perception that everybody has of themselves as a wonderful uh, team player, a caring person, etc. And that will inhibit them from sharing thoughts, insights, and especially observations that may, may be of great value in terms of innovation. So I think that's really important to not self-censor, but it goes along with the uh, capacity to present what you notice 
in a prepared and disciplined way instead of just blurting it out because you've decided you're not going to repress yourself anymore, which can be very ineffective because one of the things that I've seen is often when women make associative points by a train of thought or logic that seems very apparent to them, those who are more comfortable with a a more laser-like way of noticing don't necessarily connect the dots in the same way. So you you want to have the discipline to think through that process as well. Mm, Interesting. Another great insight. Thank you. Uh Well, I know um, we want to take some time for some of the questions um, that are out there in our audience. So if you do have some questions, uh, go ahead and use the Q&A forum. uh, And Scott's going to come on as well. Um, before we go to those questions, I did want to share something I'm pretty excited about. Um, I know when I read your book, Sally, it was helpful for, for me to digest it myself, but I really enjoyed discussing it with others. Um, so as a follow-up to this session today, um, you'll get an email. And for those that are interested, we are going to start sort of a, it's going to be very short. I'm not good at long, drawn-out book clubs, but it's one or two sessions where we bring people together, uh, probably a large group, we can do some breakouts for some smaller discussions, but discuss your book. So I think it's extremely helpful to hear other people talk about how they resonate with the habits and uh, your advice and guidance. So anyone that's interested, be on the lookout for the email from uh, Executive Next Practices because we'll tell you how to sign up if you're interested in exploring that, so. Uh, thank, thank you, Louise. I love that. <laughs> no, thanks, so, um, so hopefully some of you that are on the call will join us because I know when I have recommended your book to some of the people I'm coaching, they're just finding it so helpful um, because there's things that have held them back and they just didn't know what it was. So I think it will be a great opportunity for many of us to continue to digest um, your advice and guidance. Okay. So, Scott, what are the questions that, that we're having? Yeah, I from- think that'll be a great conversation. Again, we'll, we'll follow up with everyone with the links and uh, some other information about upcoming things. Now, we got a couple of questions here. One of the questions is, do you have recommendations for gaining sponsorship as a woman in a senior director or VP position in order to obtain feedback on these areas? You know, I do, um, but it's a little bit roundabout. Uh, sponsorship is quite, can be quite challenging. And I know personally that there are many women out there who feel sort of personally unworthy because they haven't been able to secure a high-level sponsor, often for the very simple reason that there are many more people seeking sponsors than there are senior-level le- people available for sponsorship. So that can be an impediment. Um, The best way, and I think Sheryl Sandberg had the best advice on this as somebody who was constantly being asked to be a sponsor for various people. She said, the best way to position yourself as a potential sponsee is to be active about soliciting relationships at all levels in the organization. That is, appearing like the kind of person who would be a valuable sponsee. And I thought that was wonderful advice because while I do think sponsorship is is critical and I'm very glad we've been having for the last few years the discussion about the, the value women can gain by having sponsors, having a broad network is equally important and I think that we we've somehow got sometimes gotten overly sponsor centric so the best way to position yourself is to build your network broadly and that means people at your colleague level your peer level uh, uh, colleagues that you aspire to be like and and to join and to have similar qualities in a similar career also the people who are coming up in the organization. The broader, more robust, rich, uh, and viable that your network is, the better time you're going to have attracting a sponsor. That said, yes, be on the lookout for someone who can provide you with real, honest feedback. But remember the difference between a sponsor and a mentor as well. A mentor is really someone who provides you with some of that feedback. A sponsor is somebody who invests actively in your career and and personal chemistry is a big part of sponsorship that works. 
That's such a great comment, Sally, because again, the broader you can cast your net, uh, particularly when you're looking at the sponsors, the better, better off it is. The broad, broader you can get your network. And again, that's why, that's frankly why we created this organization to do just that. Um, another uh, question here. Uh, well, one of our viewers has said, well, they're somewhat shy and feel like they're easy to step over. Um, any, any comments there? I mean, uh, what, what are some habits or some techniques they can use? Um, that, I'm sorry, I didn't like, quite understand the question. Can they you said uh, they feel that they're, they're shy and sometimes feel like they're easy to step over. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes, uh, shy and easy to step over. You know, I, I think, and, 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 you know, there's been plenty of commentary that this, uh, the Zoom era we're in or the virtual era that we are in is a good time for more introverted personalities to shine and exhibit their leadership skill. And I, I, uh, I really do agree with that point of view. That said, if we're talking about introversion, you know, that, that not really necessarily feeding off constant contact with people, but needing some time to, to pull back, um, that's, a, that's a great strength in terms, you know, potential strength in terms of leadership. In terms of shyness, the actual, um, you know, kind of reluctance or fear of uh, making demands upon people, by asking them questions or engaging them to help you, um, that's a that's a, a slightly different than just introversion. But I think that the process that I was talking about earlier of informal enlistment is a very 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 powerful way to begin breaking out of the the sort of isolation and aloneness that shy people can experience at work. And that is just identifying something that would be helpful to you, very small, and making a request of somebody, could you watch me? Or could you give me any thoughts on this? Uh, is there anything you've done that could help me to address this? Um, that you're really making allies of people, you're getting used to engaging them, make it small stakes, uh, be very specific in terms of what you ask. Don't make it sound like an open-ended thing that for the rest of you know your time together, you're going to be constantly calling on them. Make it specific and, and see what those results are. Begin to test the waters with this informal enlistment. We've got a lot about it in the book. I think it's a very, very good practice and can be rewarding because the, the, the downside of shyness is really that it keeps you isolated and it keeps you cut off from sources of help and we all need help in our career development. One thing I do need to say, because if Marsha were standing here, he would say, Sally, be sure to say that, uh, which is that once you ask somebody for any advice, there is only one response and that is thank you. Not that wouldn't work because, or uh, that's a good idea, but, or I'm not sure. You don't owe them anything. You don't owe them an explanation. You might not even take their advice. You may think their advice is not good advice, but you don't, all you need to do for a response is to say thank you because they have given you the gift of their time and attention for a moment. That, that's that's so true. What you know? What a great comment! And you're right. He would be uh, he would be tapping us on the shoulder for that one. <laughs> exactly. um, another uh, question here: um, Do you think that remote working reduces an organization's ability to challenge day to day behaviors and hold leaders accountable for inclusivity? It may. I'm not sure we have the evidence on that. And I would suspect that somebody is studying that right now. Um, what it does do that I think is on the positive side is that there is a transparency about it, that we see people in meetings show up in a very sort of natural and relaxed way often. And it's probably easier, more transparent when people are demonstrating non-inclusive behaviors. And I've actually noticed that in some of the 
the core network meetings that I have been part of, that when somebody doesn't respond to, when nobody responds to a statement or observation that's made by somebody who's at a relatively low level in the organization or the group, the network, but then is filled to the, you know, with praises or whatever for every comment that somebody at a more senior level makes, it's very obvious on in these more transparent Zoom meetings when that happens. And I think that is an opportunity to hold people to account there, obviously not publicly, none of us are interested in humiliating people, but that it is often beneficial to say, hey, I, you know, I'm not sure if you're really aware in the, that meeting, but one of the things that I observed that I think was probably not, you know, may not necessarily help your cause is that when so-and-so responded, you said nothing, and um, just, just that may be something you want to watch in the future, so that you're really offering it in the spirit of advice and help and and you know, with the on the presumption um, that they have good intentions, which is of course always the best way to to do it. So I think in that way that there's some really some really good opportunities here. Yeah, I, I would agree. And kind of related to that, one of our viewers made the comment, asked the question here. They said, "What is the right balance between being polite when listening to people speaking and not interrupting?" balanced with speaking up or interjecting in order to make your point as a woman, especially in a male-dominated meeting? I think it's really important to watch for the moment. You know, there are some people who are born monologists and will just keep going on and on. If you feel reluctant to interrupt someone like that, if you if your perception is that it would be disruptive, you can bank on the fact that other people are noticing the monologist going on and on and let someone else do that interrupting for you. Uh, but most people at senior levels have learned uh, not to be monologists, certainly not all, but, uh, mo but most people have. And in that case, it's important to watch your chance, watch for your chance to say something. Um, one of the things that, you know, it's funny, I started doing programs for, for companies after the Female Advantage Women's Ways of Leadership was published in 1990 first book to look at what women had to contribute as leaders rather than how they needed to change and adapt. So companies started asking me in back then. And what I noticed back then was that if I was speaking to a group that was 80% women, 60%, 70% of the questions at the end would come from men. Now, why was that? Because they were so fascinated and enraptured by what I was saying? Probably not. It was probably that they understood that by standing and asking a question, they were placing a marker and saying, I'm here, I have thoughts. They were saying something that someone else might come up to them afterwards and say, wow, that was an interesting point you made. And then they could, you know, have some discussion or some some bonding or begin a begin a colleagueship over that and that the men were more astute and uh, vigorous about doing that i find that women are often overly preoccupied with well what if somebody else wants to say something and i should let everybody else have a chance let other people worry about themselves they're grown-ups and um it's very helpful to in any kind of setting always try to say something that has value and is constructive, um, whether it's a question or comment. So committing going in to saying, I, I'm going to be a presence here. Um, that's more important than worrying about, am I giving everybody else a chance? Chances are you're not a monologist, you're not gonna go on and on and on for it. So let people take, take care of themselves. Yeah, that's a, such a great comment. We had a, another viewer uh, ask a similar question that ties right into this. And their question is, um, when, you give, when you have to give a presentation to a group, what advice uh, can you give to share to prepare yourself for presenting 
and tips for garnering buy-in and tuning out judgmental or insecure thoughts in your own head when making the presentation. <laughs> oh boy, how many hours do we have? I have so many thoughts on this one because I've done so much of it myself. First of all, prepare. Always prepare. Always know what you're going to say. Always think through what objections uh, could occur. So you go in fully prepared. There is really, it's hard to to be over prepared if something's good. But don't get overly focused on, you know, connecting every single dot beforehand. Recognize that you're bringing the whole of your life experience to this. Um, so you don't have to, but, but be prepared, be ready for questions, be ready for pushback um, and think about how you, the extent to which you want to and how you will stand your ground if you get, um, you know, come under uh, criticism or, or appreciate, you know, garner immediate skepticism. Don't be surprised by that. Uh, so that's number one. That's really important. Number two is part of your practice, part of your preparation needs to be being as precise and as concise as you can be. So make that part of your preparation. Can I say this more briefly? Is it possible? Uh, One thing that I find very effective for women who have a tendency to provide too much background, too many details, is to just get to the point pretty quickly and then say, if you're interested in how I arrived at this, I'm glad to share that with you later. Uh, and then, then people are intrigued rather than you're saying, well, first of all, let me tell you how I came up with this idea. And half the time they're thinking, why? I just want to know what the idea is. So, you know, get to the point, be concise, be prepared, and then tune out the perception of judgment in the room. This is, this is one of the most important things you learn as a professional speaker. If somebody looks distracted, if somebody looks bored, if somebody looks like, oh, when, when is this gonna be over? Turn your eyes to someone else because you don't know what's going on with them. In my head, when I have somebody who looks very distracted, I think, oh, they had a fight with their husband this morning. Oh, his wife's giving him a hard time. You know, I just make up a quick story in my mind that has nothing to do with me and put my eyes someplace else. Because if you get overly focused on trying to manage and please everybody in the room based on your perceptions about how engaged they are, you will really undermine yourself. You wanna be present for what you have to say Uh, for your message, for your task, for what your intention is in this presentation and not let other things uh, distract you. Don't use discipline your radar to serve you, not to undermine you. Great, great, um, great (laughs) point, Sally. And if I could just add one tidbit for those of you that are trying to perfect presentation skills, I love uh, Zoom, right? Because you could actually have a Zoom meeting with yourself. (laughs) Higher presentation just with yourself and then review it. Now the review is, it's painful because you have to sit there and watch yourself, but you can learn so much about your, the crazy things that you say or do. And uh, to Sally's point, you can work on being more concise or whatever that thing is you're working on. So uh, you can even consider that makes it easier than um, trying for the first time out in front of an important audience. Exactly. That's such great advice, too, that particularly with the Zoom environment, as we all know, you talk about your viewers being distracted. Uh, you know, they could have in any minute, in any minute, a family member or family pet being uh, clawing at them in some way. So, um, again, there's a lot of extra distraction there. So, to stay focused is incredibly important. It's also interesting, Sally, uh, in watching Michelle Obama's documentary, uh-huh. uh, Becoming, and she had that very same comment about her first year as a first lady and trying to tune out that negativity, stay focused, be on point, be concise. And that helped her through that very, very difficult first year as a first lady. So I I think that's terrific advice. Um, Louise, do you have some other comments? And I uh, I wanna just check here. We've got some great questions coming in. Uh, One other thing here uh, for Sally, what are the three things white women in a mixed group of leaders at work need to keep in mind? Oh, well, that's a, that's a question. That's a really important question these days. Number one is keep your sensitivity active and don't go in assuming everybody has the same experience as you. That's what's really important. People don't want to be 
um, you know, sort of played to or placated, but people want to know that you have the sensitivity to recognize that not everybody evokes the same responses that you do, has the same experience that you do, and you want to incorporate that into how you present. Not, not, and I've seen people do this in this period of time, which I find quite uncomfortable, and I think everybody does, not um, call out your experience in the way that you've had it and then say, I recognize some of you may have had different experiences because that's almost admitting your own failure to, uh, to take that into account. So I think that the key thing is to be very careful to not assume that people go in there. And that's what I meant, you know, when Louise asked that question earlier about cultural humility is to recognize that, that, you know, people come to the table with very different experiences and to recognize that that is a strength, that that is part of what makes having different people at the table so valuable. My own great friend and mentor, Roosevelt Thomas, who was part of our learning network group who died a number of years ago and was a great pioneer of diversity. And Roosevelt always said, you know, diversity is not having people who look different and have the same opinion at the table. And, you know, that the real strength of that is that is the difference and the ability of people to be very clear about what their experiences are. One other thing I think that that I've seen really work, I I remember doing a program for managing partners of global law firms. This is a tough bunch of guys. And um, and this was not my exercise, but I was doing a program on, on, on inclusive behaviors for them. And somebody else was doing some other segment, and they had a really interesting exercise where they asked these people to think of a time when they had felt misunderstood or like an outsider or like someone, you know, who's regarded with skepticism. And it was remarkable how many of these men thought of an experience that they'd had with their own child being misunderstood, a child who was autistic, a child who had learning disabilities, et cetera, and the, and the rage that they felt inside when they saw people making assumptions about this child. And to understand, to kind of, you know, think about what that feels like, what those moments have felt like to you, and understanding the full range of emotions that they evoke rather than, you know, the sort of default, like, well, you certainly brought a lot of emotion to that question, you know, well, maybe there was a lot of emotion was stirred. So I think those are really, really important. It's, I don't know whether it's three things or not, but it's, it's a, the frame of mind you go into a meeting with, and the amount of, of cultural humility and understanding of the range of emotions that certain situations can evoke in people who have had very different experiences and responses than you have. No, that's such great advice. Well, we're, we're coming up on the hour, so uh, we'll move to a close, but I uh, did want to uh, share a couple of comments from our viewers very quickly. Uh, this is not a question, but a statement that uh, they just wanted to thank you and Louise for your terrific conversation. Then uh, they're planning on purchasing the book and look forward to instituting their own best next practices in their life and career. Uh, so again, thank you so much for this conversation. And to Luigi's point, um, not only with her uh, group that she's forming uh, for a discussion about this, but we, we'll have to have you back. Uh, we'll, we'll get through this. We will all get through this. I'd love to have you back and, and do a, a check-in on this in the future. But again, Sally, thank you so much for your time today. Um, we we're just delighted to have you. Louise, thank you so much, as always, for your support. We'll look forward to seeing you both soon. And again, for your viewers, again, you'll uh, get a follow-up email from us. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing these viewers on Thursday morning of this week. Thanks again.